Myself, so please excuse if there is a, there is a hiccup in there. Um, so you might see me, please. Um, please, please remember to go on the TopConf website and read the talk afterwards. There's a slide in there you probably already know that until you can read. And I'm also happy if you ping me on Twitter or just come to me and talk to me after the talk. It's, it's would be super helpful. So. Uh, topic of the talk is, might be a little misleading, and for that I'll reveal uh, why I choose that title, um, because I will first talk about network organizations and what those are and why they matter to most of you, um, and, so, and then the part where I talk about uh, new skills for technical geeks, or who of you considers yourself to be a technical geek? Okay, a few. Who doesn't know what a technical lead is? You don't know. Okay, a technical lead in, in, in my words means that you are charged with the impossible task of making decisions about things nobody knows how they will work uh, in terms of how will we implement stuff. You need to know software development skills and then you have to do it with other people. That means you have to lead people and the the leading people part is actually the hard part in, in projects. And the, that adding to the impossibility, impossibility is that nobody teaches you how to lead people in your reputation. It's not part of your degree, probably. So, um, let's find how we can advance that. So, short intro about me. Um, I work at a company called Resource for Humans. We are a distributed team that is 
transforming organizations into entrepreneurial networks. So creating networks of organizations or turning existing organizations into networks is actually what we do and what we get paid for. So that's where I came into a connection with that topic because I'm as a software developer, we are supporting that, that approach with software that supports the, the consultancy approach, but of course I see what happens in those organizations. And so what is a network organization? Um, you might have heard about the topic when Zappos a few years back said, okay, we are turning to holacracy. Holacracy is a pretty strong, opinionated, and, and I'd say um, very artificial scientific engineer framework to run an organization without central leadership. And Zappos choose to do that. And they more or less have not so good experiences with it, but you might have heard it from the, from the recent news. But the idea of working in a network is actually quite old. So in, in, a, in, in the past, so one of the most prominent examples is H&B. <coughs> they, they started to, to work in the network in the 50s. So the, the H&B founders understood that in order to provide a meaningful contribution to society, not to their shareholders, for them that wasn't important, you can't have centralized decisions. And HP is one of the few Fortune 500 companies that's still around. I think we heard that statistic, how many Fortune 500 companies are non-existent quite often during a conference, it's a classic. HP is still there. And the HP today, the HP of 2007, is not the HP of, of the 50s, and the founders are already out, but still, it's they are still working based on that legacy. And another great example is, is Zemco. The founder of Zemco, Ilse Zemler, he, he wrote an awesome book, you might know, it's a, it's a seven day weekend, and um, I highly recommend that. Um, but when you ask him, how many companies or how many departments do you have in your organization? And he's the majority, he was the majority shareholder until 2009. He didn't know that because it changed on a weekly basis. And they, they, he, he grew the company from, in, in 2000, I think in, in 20 years he changed, he, he grew the company from 90 people to 3,000 people based on network business, based on giving people a choice what to work on and how to work. So, and it, it works even in the military. In, in 1999, David Marquet became the captain of the worst performing nuclear submarine of the United Navy. It was basically the worst performing marine ship in the entire Navy. And he, he turned the ship around, it's, that's actually the title of his book, and he implemented network leadership methods on the submarine, and these principles are now in place on every submarine on the United States Navy. And the result also for the Santa Fe was that that ship became the best performing vessel in the Navy. So it doesn't only apply to companies, businesses that, that create, that need to create money, but it also works where you are actually, yeah, at the military or, or where you need to, to, to fight enemies. Yeah, yeah that's, that's um, so, and what the, the interesting, the interesting property of network organizations is that they mirror the market. So, who of you works in a company that has a five-year plan? One. So, and if I have asked, would have asked you that ten years ago which company back then had a five-year plan? There were more, I'd say. So, we, we, what we, yeah, almost, that was a thing back then. So when I, when I entered my industry 15 years ago, that was a thing, to have a 10-year plan and have a five-year plan. Today, it's, it's you can do it, <laughs> but it, it serves no purpose anymore. Because the market, the markets are global, 
your customers are global, they are connected, and their demands are changing so fast, you can't have a centralized decision based on something you came up with three years ago. That will no longer work. For instance, if there's a, if there's a, if a train doesn't, uh, is getting late, Deutsche Bahn is not possible, is not able to inform their customer in time for their, where to go next, because they can't scale that information. But people will immediately turn to Twitter, to their followers, to their friends, to the internet, and inform themselves and spread that information in the train. And that's not a service the company can provide, and that makes the company look bad. Because the customers say, hey, I can do this, I can find that information. Why isn't the company providing that to me? And something else is also apparent um, in, and we've seen that last year, the hierarchical hierarchies create systems where that provide, uh, I, let's say, false inspirations for people on what to work and what is important. And especially in the last year, um, you've all heard about VW. And that is just the tip of the iceberg. But what happens is if you have, if you give someone a 12 month plan and say, hey, I want you to increase whatever you do by 20%, and I don't care if it's possible or if it's sensible or if it makes sense, but it's, it's easy for me to measure you by that simple number. And people would start trying to achieve that. And at VW, what they did, they did it even though it was illegal. And that is happening everywhere. And now people in, in, in my age, so I'm born around the 80s, um, we are 35 <coughs> to 40 now, and we are coming, we are now part of the middle management or even the upper management. And we grew up with a sense for purpose and the need for true answers. So why should I increase my revenue by 20%? Give me an answer that is not because shareholders. So and we are now also part of an industry and we are turning away from these big companies because they, can't, they won't provide us with answers, they give us working environments which are horrible for us. So, and what, we, what happens when we, so, oh, there, okay, that, that slide is, is, a short, uh, is a short teaser to what happens when we transform an organization. We start here, where that is the customer down there, and we have some well, the people at the hotline and the people that basically do the grunt work. And then we have middle level managers. So this, this can be, of course, be up to 10 levels or more. Um, and at the top, there is, are a few like super bosses, CEOs, whatever. And what I said before, if we want to provide a great service to our customer, we need to move the problem solution capabilities from right now it's, there's a problem, I don't know what to do with that, so let's ask my manager. The manager says, well, I've never seen that before, let's ask my manager. So and it goes up and down and it takes weeks, months, I don't know. We, have, uh, we had a customer last year <coughs> in the telecom industry in the Netherlands, their average response time to inquiries for business customers was 60 days. Not one six, but six zero. So that is, that is, in no circumstances is that an acceptable time. So what, what we want to do is to create a network is, that enables the company to have a free flow of information, have the people that know how to solve the problems to actually 
are be able and are allowed to solve problems. Move the customer in the center and give everybody decision rights. And what happens is, yeah, the managers, they disappear. There's nobody I need to go to and ask for permission. Can I give the person that's calling me in a hotline a rebate or a refund? Or can I go to the place and maybe look at the thing? Yeah. Can I talk to my colleague? I first think like, no, we can't talk to the IT department. They're in that, that next level and the door is always closed. And that comes from a customer service representative. And that's horrible. That, is, that actually happens. So, and yeah, we can talk about the telco that we have, we have worked with T-Mobile in the Netherlands. That is where that happens. So that's, I'm not telling you like stories that will be in 10 years. That happens and we are doing that. And in other companies, how we also did that. And right now we're working with Accenture. Accenture is one of the biggest, they have 400,000 employees. And they have the same problem. And if these big ones are now going into, okay, let's turn down our hierarchy, then this will affect you. So and now, as you see before, you are, you are here if you're a techie or somewhere there. And then there comes this consultancy and says, hey, we don't, so what you're right, doing right now and what you're actually, what, what most of little managers are doing is sitting on information. They know some people, they get information from up down and then they decide, okay, where do I put that information? Which one of my direct reports can I make happy or won't I make happy or who wasn't nice to me in the last year? And that creates a lot of, well, useless friction in the company. We eliminate, uh, we, we get rid of that everything. And <laughs> now you need some new skills if you want to still keep your job. And now I'm going to, to go step by step through, um, through some of my observations. I see what actually needs to change. And are there any questions for the, for the first part right now? If just say, I don't know, Colleen, uh, ask me something. So one of the, one of the, the most important skills that the, the, the way project teams are assembled, even at bigger companies, will totally change. So you might have that on a, right now already, on a, on a department level, where your department head comes in and I said, hey, we have this mobile project um, who is interested, who wants to do it, and those are maybe your 10 people uh, that are available and know each other to, to, to choose to work on that project. But they are, it's not like really uh, um, uh, uh, sorry. Voluntary? Because what else can they do? I mean, in the, in the past, they're, they are totally tied to their manager, their, their profit depends on the team performance and stuff like that, so there is no much leeway. In the future, they will be able to choose to work on any project in your whole organization. And looking at Generation Y, uh, tend to have really tough questions and ask ourselves, so especially since for us the motivation changed in the last year, we don't have big like houses anymore, we have fewer children, we don't drive big cars, so we're really independent and we've learned from, from uh, the 2008 financial crisis. I, I was aware in, in business uh, or already working when we're, there was the first dot com, dot com crash that Nothing is reliable anymore. As a company, you can't offer us any reliability, uh, real, reliability beyond the next half year. And that's true for, for, for huge companies too. And so you really want to, to know why should I work on a project? Why is that important? So your skill, if you want to have great people working on your projects, which, which in the end, makes you provide value to the company, 
having successful projects? Absolutely depends on how you're able to explain where are we going with the project? Why is it important for the company? Huh? Why shouldn't you work on another project? Huh? Uh, why should you at SpaceX? Why should you work on the on the on the Moon or on the Mars project and not on the Moon flying around the Moon project? If you can shoot both, both sounds exciting. And um, what what else will happen um, is. You also need to improve your skills on talking to non-peers. That means to people that don't have the same education as you. We will see more and more and more blue-collar coders coming into our organizations because software will be everywhere. Software will be in every department, will be part of every product value creating process of marketing, sales, HR, whatever. People are learning to code there, but they they don't have like the they don't won't have a CS degree. And you who has a high education and has a CS degree and knows about uh, I don't know complexities and runtimes and how to do bubble sort and whatever, you need to find a language which they will understand and enable them to, to make use of their craft. Um, so I, and that basically also boils down to, to learning more about co communication between human words. So there are two, two important things or schemes to look up or, or yeah, definitions. That's, one is the transactional analysis um, where there is a model that the idea is that if you talk to a person, there are two roles you're taking. Uh, you have a parent role, you have an adult role, and you have a child role, and this is true for both sides. And it often happens that you're talking from, uh, from parent to child, or from child to parent, and if that happens, usually you will clash, and you have to understand these things that happen, and what what basically the science behind communication is in order to be a great communicator. The next thing, um, you will learn need to learn how to pitch new ideas to sponsors. You will also you are so somewhere stuck in the middle. Um, there there. The, 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 let's say the less experienced uh, uh, people in your organization are pretty, uh, well, they are pretty safe in doing the work they know. They will be coders, designers, whatever. Um, top level management or <coughs> head of your company, they, are, they will still be employees, they will still be stakeholders and shareholders and they will have the money and uh, they will still decide how to distribute it and where to invest. But they won't come up with the ideas. They won't come up with uh, how to, so if Elon Musk says, I want to go to Mars, he is not able to actually define how they will achieve that. He just sets the goal and says, here's cash, now let's figure out how to go there. And if, you're, you, if you can't come up with a great product pitch to a sponsor, you will not be able to work on interesting projects. Because you're too expensive, or your salary is too high, or whatever, or you don't have the, the actual technical, the real hard technical skills to work on implementation, and you don't have money to spend. So your skills need to go more in the direction of a, basically a startup founder in a company. And you can learn that, you can actually so one, one tip or one idea is to go to a Startup Weekend. There's a website called startupweekend.org and there's a Startup Weekend happening every weekend around the globe. And it takes you around 150 euros to fill it in on, on the next weekend. And there you can practice two things. First, you can take, be, take part in a team that works over a weekend on a crazy idea 
And after two days on Sunday, they will present it in front of a panel. And that experience will give you so much to think about. How am I going to pitch an idea? What are the things I have to think about? How to well, find out if an idea is actually valuable, if it makes sense to pursue it? And if you've done that for a while, you can change the role and become a coach on a startup team. A coach helps other teams there to sharpen their idea. And the coaching part also becomes much, much, much more important. Um, as I said before, if you're, you're not that good, and you will be measured by the success of your project. So if you have pitched your project, and you have got the money, and you have explained how great your idea is, Still, you will find, you, you can't just select people from the pool and say, I take that developer and that one and that one. But you have to, to yeah, well, you will have some people on a team that they're not the 10 times coder, if they exist at all, I doubt that, or A-level or whatever. And then your role now becomes to identify their shortcomings. To, to be, to observe their behavior and identify where they could improve. And that's a skill um, that is, we also don't, we don't get taught how to do that. Mm. And we are also not talking, uh, so, so shortcomings is, is oftentimes easy to spot. What's more interesting is that a lot of people enter organizations based on uh, a letter size job description. Yeah, I, I think I can do Java, Git, and I've done some database, SQL, it sounds good, Mongo, okay, check. They will enter based, and, and your role will be, you will be coding on our platform, whatever. People are much more complex in their skills than those 10 bullet points. And for some of them, what they think are their skills and what the market pays them for is actually not their true, their, their true profession. And if you can, if you are able to identify something a developer can do actually better than coding, this will create a lifetime fan for you, this will mean if you as a company and if you make time and resources for that person to change in a better role that suits them better, where they're more happy, where they can express their true well, talents, this will create a so much better bound to the organization and to the company. And that is what Generation Y is actually looking for. That, that's what I also talk when I mean about purpose. It's, we don't, we don't work on, okay, I, we can, as a company, make money with that. That doesn't motivate us. Can we learn stuff? Are we happy at work? At the, at the end of the day, do we have the feeling, and it's a total subjective feeling, that we have actually achieved something? And that is super individual. And so, as a coach, you're both. You're the one, at sometimes you have to and, and that's also, that depends totally on people. Some people, they need to be yelled at. And they won't get mad at you if you do it. And they say, at the end, of, yeah, it was good that you yelled at me because I needed that. And if you think that works for the next person, you are super wrong. Because the next person will say, okay, you yelled at me, I quit. That's it. I, will, I, I, I won't accept to be yelled at me at any cost, so I'm quitting because I will find something. And figuring out these big nuances, so not a nuance, uh, that, it, that takes skill and it takes time. Uh, so I, I skip road to that one because I think that, that fits better. Because I can only identify <laughs> these, these perks or how to deal with a person if I look, if I, if I look at myself, if I learn how Am I reacting? Let's see. Um, how am I reacting to feedback? How, what drives me? 
what, yeah, how does my brain work? Um, what kind of work environment do I need? If I, if I don't start with myself and ask me those questions, um, I will have a hard time uh, learning to read other people. And I mean, most of us, so most of us or, or coding jobs right now are typically filled by introverts or the majority is an introvert. But unfortunately, introversion doesn't mean that we actually, that we, that we, that we, yeah, that we um, take a lot of time on self-reflection. It just means we like to be alone. And that's a, that, is, that is a problem. So we have, we are not really made, on average, um, the most of us, or yeah, um, we are not really made for that kind of work and change introversion, coaching, reading people. Yeah. Um, network sounds, I don't know, it sounds obvious, um, but maybe not. So, I'm, the thing is, if I have, how, how do I find the people for my projects? Um, I can, Maybe there's a company roster or Facebook at work or I have a LinkedIn list with every employee and I can search for PHP and Java or whatever. There is no system out there that, that, that connects, collects the soft skills. So um, in order to, to actually know which people are suited for the job and whom I should approach <coughs> and who will follow me, I have to be a great networker. And networking means I need to know people in the whole organization. I need to start to actually get to learn them. What, what do they want to do in five years? What are they working on now? Um, what, what are their preferred skills? And this, that, is, that is my part of the networking job. And I also need to be visible as a tech lead or as a, as a, yeah, as a project lead. I need to create a followership within the organization because people will only join my projects if they trust me. If they trust that, that I have the skills to assemble a team that is actually fit to do that, uh, that I have the skills to work with all the, the things that will happen on the way, and that I want that, that they invest, that it's actually a good enterprise to, to, to work with me. Or, I don't know. Yeah. I don't like the term project. So that, that they won't be disappointed by me. And this decision is not easy made. It takes time for people to trust each other. So that's why it's important to start networking in the organization. And there's so many, so many <coughs> ways. And for instance, organizing uh, events within the organization, organizing brown bag lunches, talking, offering, mentoring. We will talk about that later probably. So it's, it's uh, so, it's, mentoring is such a key skill um, for you personally, but also for many of the things I'm talking about. Um, remote, I'm a remote fanatic. Um, I have to put it in there because, not because I think everybody, every company should be remote. But there are two things, two other things I, I've observed. We have, being a company that actually we can work remotely um, enables, for instance, part-time work. And part-time work often is, is done by parents. And parents, it, they are not remote in the sense that they are far away from your headquarter, from your office, but they have to pick up the children in the afternoon and after they have brought their kids to bed, they will work again. Or they would work again if it was possible. And if it was accepted, and if everybody in the company knew how to work with people that are not in the same room. And that is one of the, the big challenges to, to where our clients see that they, they can't find enough of those uh, not married, uh, middle-aged white guys that can work 40 plus hours a week. 
but they will find a lot of people and it totally makes sense for, for IT projects. People that work in part-time. I don't need a 40 hour per week tester maybe on my small project. I don't need a, a, a DevOps person that works all the time on one project. So the work is already not full time, so it makes sense to actually create a culture in an organization that allows for people to be on the outside. And another important part is diversity. Everybody's talking about diversity, and there is now actually, there is money to lose if you're not diverse enough. Uh, last week there was a post from, from a bigger company, I think it was HP, that said, all of our legal bills to our legal offices or our lawyers that send us an invoice, if you don't have at least, an, uh, uh, I think, 15% non uh, people that are non-white, or your diversity score is 15%, whatever it means, um, then we will deduct 10% of that invoice because your solution won't be the best because we know if you hire around where your office is, if you hire in that area, you will find people that have a pretty equal social background. They all went to the same university. They all have been taught by the same professors. So most of the people will have in their brain the same path where their solution goes. And that means the variety of your solutions and the, the creativity and your innovation will really suffer if you just stick to one location. So opening up your organization for remote workers from all, all of you working with them, there are companies that say, hey, our clients, our clients are worldwide. And you can't give us a project team that is 90% cis white males meaning guys in suits around 35. We don't accept that. You need to make better or you won't get the contract. And yeah, excellent. <laughs> uh, I, how many minutes? Oh yeah, okay, that's good. Um, that's good, that's good part, diversity. So as I said before, if you hire around your company from your university, then they will be probably the same. But what changes is that more and more diversity, for instance, introduces people from different social backgrounds. And if we are not only having educated CS degree developers, but more and more blue collar workers, and people from different professions learning to code, from marketing and design and whatever, we have to deal more and more with extroverts, with people that thrive on chaos, that want to well, talk to you all day. And what's important is that we need those people. We need both. We, if, we, if, just every, if all introverts stick together, yeah, it's gonna be a quiet and relaxed day, but the solution won't be that exciting. So, but what you have to understand and learn is where on that spectrum are you? So, it's not a binary thing, introvert, extrovert, it's a huge spectrum. And you, you have to learn what am I and what does that mean? And how, so uh, the, the simple explanation is basically, um, if you're an extrovert, you're getting energy from surrounding you by people. So if you're tired in the evening and the extrovert goes to a party, he will be really happy at around 12. So, and he will be full of energy. If an introvert goes to that party, he will go at home at eight. Because for introverts, people drain energy. And that is important for you to understand what drains, where do I get my energy from? Because that, that, that is important how um, that, that affects your cognitive resources and energy. And if you don't control that, if you put your week full of meetings and you're an introvert, you will be dead on the weekend. It's important to know that. Um, yeah. The, the next thing, what, what also changes is that IT becomes the, 
become such an integrated part of everything um, that you can no longer hide behind some technical specification and said, oh, I implemented what the business guy told me. On it, I expect all tests passed. You have to, and we heard it around all the time, so I, I make it short, um, think about your customer. Learn what is the value you're providing for the customer. So you're not getting paid by the business analyst that gives you the spec. You're getting paid by the customer that buys your product. And if you don't understand how the money that the customer spends at some checkout in, at, I don't know, a supermarket for your product, how that ends up in your department, you will have a big problem of explaining why the project is important and also creating actually value for the customer. And ownership means that you, that you take responsibility for delivering that value and not delivering that 99% uptime. In, I think around 10 years ago, uh, companies started to get rid of research and development departments. I don't know if any one of you noticed, but I don't see them around. And that's, I find that really problematic. Mm. It, is, it is clear, or it is, well, it is easy to just go into reaction mode and say, hey, if the customer comes and has a problem, yeah, we will find someone who hacks something together and we will find a solution. That works. But I don't know, that, that, is, that, that makes you replaceable as a solution provider. Because I, I then can go to any company and everybody will say, yeah, we'll do it. And they will barely fix the problem or create a solution for me, but they don't provide real value. As an organization to really uh, provide a, a, an innovative solution, you need to get ahead of the problem of your clients. That means you need to start researching again. And research means, so in the, in the past it was trying out technologies and looking at new stuff. Um, I would add to that research part also trend research. Um, that's the thing where you try to anticipate which trends we have, like Pokemon Go, if, will that be uh, a thing that goes away? Or is there something to earn in there? And why it's so important? Well, why, that creates an, an, a huge opportunity for you because no company out there, or rarely any company out there, has um, ideas on their own anymore. They are totally in, they, they have no clue what the customer wants because they are too big to talk to them. And if you as a solution provider go to them and say, hey, I have, I have that idea, here's a prototype, let's do, let's work three months on that and take your, well, you have like a thousand shops in, in the UK, let's take 10% of them and do a prototype there. They love you. They, they, they so depend on, on your input uh, as a technical solution provider. And that is also true if you're, if you're within the organization. Yeah? So many people are totally overwhelmed of what the market is doing. So innovate, trend research, and also a startup, you can learn that skills, how to actually, okay, if I have an idea, how do I find out if that makes sense? Yeah? And in, in network organizations, you, you will have a much more easier opportunity to actually create a, an in-house startup. At Zemco, everybody can draft an idea, and there are regular uh, um, um, meetings with the directors where you pitch an idea, and they will give you money for six months or 12 months to try out that idea, and that gets more and more and more common. So, and that's my last slide, and now there we come full circle to my initial title, why I choose that word. If you're able to do some of those things, or many, you will actually be able to 
motivate your developers because you're able to explain why it's so important for you to work on it, what will you learn, and because you have explained it to them, they will say, yes, I'm in. And if they, on their own, decide to work on a project, they will, they will be doing so much better work. The result will be so much better because they, they understand it, they see value in it. That's perfect. Questions? Are you, are you trying to get away uh, from that, or do you think it's, it, it takes a lot of your energy and it's hard to focus on, 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 yeah, well, on chats with people or on discussions? Or are you someone that, that yeah, if, if we need someone to do a presentation, if you're the one that says, hey, yeah, I'm doing that, um, or organize, I don't know, huge group activity, then you're probably So that's that's not that's weird at all. Okay. Yeah. And there's also there's also a thing called Envy Bird. So and actually there's there's not the introvert or the extrovert. And <coughs> Envy Birds are people that are right in the middle. And that they 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 switch between them. Oh I see. I'd say software these days is, is super exciting. If you look at developments like VR or soft uh, uh, computer games or, I don't know, 3D printing, and I, it has, you, there are so many things that, that, that speak to people that, that are beyond or that, that, that don't think it's, it's a super nice day to code for eight hours. So um, how to attract more extroverts, I, I'd say, um, yeah, bring software to life uh, in, in the sense of move it out of your, the big screen yeah, and, and get people in touch with Raspberry Pis, with, with Internet of Things, with, with LED devices you can connect to your toaster and if the toaster is done, it gets green. And that's, that, there's such a playful approach and, and possibilities to, to work on small projects, but I also understand that it's not it's not rocket science what you're doing. Yeah? So okay. I think we uh, yes. Yeah we were we were over. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Done. Don't forget to rate the talk on the website and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference.
auch kein Problem, also mir ging es ja auch um die, wir bleiben ja, wir sind ja aber noch beide da, weißt du? wir werden ja nicht ausgetauscht, sondern wir müssen ja mit diesen neuen äh, Umständen auch äh, klarkommen. 